The Security Collective acknowledges the traditional owners of the land on which we have recorded this podcast and pay our respects to their elders past and present. The Security Collective podcast is recorded and shared with you in partnership with LastPass, the leading password manager. LastPass enables companies of every size with the tools necessary to secure and centralise control of employee passwords and apps. You can learn more about LastPass at lastpass.com. Hello, I'm Claire Pales and welcome to the Security Collective podcast. Today's guest is Stephen Kennedy. Stephen is a CIO these days after spending the early part of his career in software engineering. Our conversation today covered the balance for engineers between security and functionality. We talked about secure coding expectations and also the role compliance plays in software development. There's some really great learnings in this week's episode as Stephen shares his experience moving from being an engineer into C-level leadership and the security lens through which he then had to look through. So please welcome Stephen Kennedy to the Security Collective. So Stephen, it's great to have you joining us in the Security Collective podcast today. Thanks for having me. So you're a CIO now, but you're a software engineer by trade, and I'm really keen to talk today a little bit about software engineering from a security sense. I'm interested to understand what the vibe is for engineers when it comes to security, because is there a desire from leaders like CIOs for engineers to ensure their code is secure? Or is there much more of a focus on producing code that meets customer and business requirements as the priority? So I think the first thing is that security is what's considered a non-functional requirement. So it's like other things like performance, reliability, robustness, those sorts of things, which engineers need to, to think about when they're producing code. And a lot of it tends to be sort of an implicit requirement from businesses where they sort of just expect it to work. So the level of security I find tends to depend on the organization, the values, and then other aspects like the problem domain they're working in, like obviously something like banking's got a lot more of a compliance need around it. So security just naturally becomes a, a more pressing concern in the size of the business. So larger businesses tend to have a bit more of a, of a security focus because the, the severity of the impact if there is a security issue tends to be higher for a larger business. Some businesses, you know, security can be like a bit of a sausage factory. Um, you know, again, the businesses don't necessarily care how it's there. They just want to make sure that it's in place. So Therefore, it's really up to the leaders in the business, so the CIO, the CTO, and if the, you know, they need to have a CISO to you know, come up with the initiatives and sell those initiatives to the business. In terms of the who's on the hook for it, again, it tends to be like those C-level executives, so they're the ones that really need to drive that. And partially as well, it also depends on the, the, C, the CIO and CTO in terms of you know, their own disposition towards security. You know, some can be quite lax and others can be quite stringent around like what sort of security that they want to have in place. So in terms of coming back to the business requirements, I think just depends on the problem being solved, right? So um, obviously um, security can't get in the way of uh, meeting product deliverables um, in terms of like producing the, the outcomes that the business needs. But just like, you know, if you've got to produce uh, an ease website, then you need to make sure that the software performs as well as, you know, is also being secure. Yeah, I mean, there definitely must be, and I've seen this before myself, a balance for engineers when you think about what security will often mean. And there's these trade-offs often for functionality. Sometimes it's perceived as a slower development process because security is involved. That balance, as you say, would be hard for the engineers to be making the call themselves. Much more has to be a cultural or a leadership decision as to where that balance lies to make sure the customer is getting what they need, but also from a security consciousness perspective that the organisation is doing the right thing too. Yeah, I mean, it can be a trade-off just like the other non-functional requirements. So um, there's things where it impacts stuff like code complexity. You can do like quite simple code changes to make the, the software a lot more secure but that can also in turn result in what's called regression issues. So software that was previously working now breaks because you've introduced something where um, you're putting maybe restrictions on the browser and what it's allowed to do, and that in turn breaks things. And computer software isn't just what the software engineers themselves are building. It tends to be built on the, the shoulders of giants, right? So you might introduce a security measure that seems to make sense for you know, your product, but the dependency that it's got in place might be broken because of, you know, a content security policy, for instance, that you've put in place, which blocks content from a site, which this other component depends on. That's where a lot of the complexity can come from in terms of you don't necessarily know what you're going to break at times when you are introducing additional security measures. There can be also performance issues as well. You've got to go check permission from another server, for instance, around um, whether or not you can do something. So that in turn introduces additional complexity. 
I also think there's a bit of an issue as well where there's a bit of a knowledge gap that happens at times between a software engineer, you know, delivering what they need to deliver and maybe a CISO going, well, from a compliance and from a policy and from a best practice standpoint, you need to do this. And what tends to happen at times where there is this gap is causes this big issue where changes take a lot longer to implement than they should because of, of a gap of, of a misunderstanding. Or, you know, some of the scariest security issues I've seen is where, you know, the engineers have either sort of ignored the requirement because it's too hard or complex, or they've sort of done a hack or a work around because they've not really understood the fundamentals of things like OAuth or, you know, other technologies. And it in turn creates like a, a potential attack vector for someone malicious coming in because they've created a security hole, basically. So, you know, it's really important that I think um, if you are being a security conscious organization and you've got training and in, in, in place and you've got subject matter experts who are able to bridge that gap, just like to an extent with business analysts, right? They're there to bridge the gap between, you know, the business in terms of requirements and the software engineers implementing it. I think there's also a bit of an issue at the moment between, um, you know, security experts in terms of from a, a pillars perspective, this is what we really should be doing and delivering to a software engineer who may not necessarily come from a security background. And you often see that a lot also with penetration testing results. Like it might, you know, you see some reports and it's kind of might be baffling to people why why this security issue in place. And it's because there's such a big knowledge gap. Yeah, I mean, I definitely see from my clients and my perspective that there's a lot of reviews that are still managed by third parties and, I mean, particularly pen tests um, because you want an independent review. But are you seeing in the engineering community an uplift in secure coding skills? Is there an interest there for engineers to start to take on this as a skill set? And maybe it's a differentiator for their CV if they've had exposure in secure coding. Are you seeing that as a desire or is it really left to the CISO and those independent third parties to make sure the security is in place? Um, Again, I think a lot of it comes down to organisational culture. You know, I've been in IT for 20 plus years now. I certainly think over the last five years, the, the more recent five years, there's definitely been a, a significant uplift in software engineers and their appreciation and their appetite for security. You know, certainly when I started 20 years ago, you know, like a data breach or an issue or things like that just didn't get the media attention that it gets now. You know, the security community is a lot more mature these days as well in terms of things, um, in terms of, you know, also being a lot more pragmatic as well in terms of um, what, what should be in place. When I go back to organizational culture, and again, I think agile you know, in terms of like a, the the software methodology has, has done a lot towards security. Um, DevOps has been around around for a lot, for a while, but also you now starting to see the next iteration and progression of that, which is DevSecOps. And I think you know, software engineers in a lot of ways haven't maybe not necessarily leading the charge, but working quite closely op- closely with operations. Then also, you know, security people to produce these improvements. So things like the software, you know, when you do a deployment, automatically run, look doing scanning for vulnerabilities. Doing things like, as I said before, computer software tends to be built up of packages or, you know, images or other things that off the other vendors or other parties or open source libraries that people have produced. So scanning those for malware, viruses, are they verified? Do they say who they are? Those sorts of things. And I think that's really where you're starting to see um, an evolution. I think, you know, particularly for smaller businesses, that's where it's really valuable, right? Because if you can automate it, then the cost to the business to um, implement good, high quality, secure software is lower. Your point about smaller businesses is really important because they don't have the resources to have big teams or have penetration tests done all the time. And is there basics? Is there basics that, in your mind, any organisation, whether they're developing the code themselves or they're outsourcing it, what their expectations should be around secure code? Yeah, I mean, I think the super basics are obviously making sure that the people working on the code have a good, a good understanding of the OWASP top 10. So that, these are the top 10 web application vulnerabilities. So making sure your engineers, certainly, you know, the people, depending again on the, the org culture, at least the people in terms of uh, in charge of the, the quality and, you know, doing the reviews and things like that, have a good got a good understanding of what those are. Not only what are those vulnerabilities, but how do you mitigate or remediate those vulnerabilities as well? I think, you know, again, super basic, making sure that, you know, data is encrypted at rest and in transit isn't really important. No homebrew sort of cryptography or auth solutions, which are um, still um, still rampant, I think, in, in, um, in terms of code that I've looked at as well. So, you know, using off-shelf products or using well-known, well-trusted open source libraries is, is, is really important. Automated deployments is, I think, something that really you should be looking to do. I think security misconfiguration is a really big um, issue. Um, and so if you can automate those as well, that just 
alleviates that problem and in turn also forms part of the documentation as well in terms of all, how are things set up and how are things secured. Uh, if you're outsourcing, I think you still need to have trusted onshore people to review and look at things. And also, even if they're um, developing it off- offshore, it should still be in the repositories and things like that that you you, you control and, and own. Ultimately, customers and partners aren't really going to care if a breach was a result of um, you or your outsourcer. Uh, and, and finally, I think, you know, it's really important to understand where your personal data is being stored and how it's protected and for what purpose it's being stored for. And we've talked at length this season about third-party risk and about making sure that your code and your data and your um, IP and your business information is under your own control when it comes to security and that you as an organisation have the responsibility no matter who your third or fourth parties are. Um, And, you know, I think when it comes to code, it couldn't be more important, especially when it is the one thing that's often done offshore and is often uh, something that's outsourced, especially by smaller organisations or if there's a very specific need by an organisation, then they might look to a third party who has a specific set of skills. It's not as simple as just outsourcing the development. There there are so many other moving parts. Yep, definitely. You've got all sorts of compliance things as well. Like, you know, particularly when you're working with larger parties as well, they're also interested in, you know, like who's, you know, looking at the the code or the data, you know. There's also like non-production data or something is also important. Like people tend to think a lot around like the security of just what's in production, but I still see a lot of organizations where they will store like even real personal data and things like that and in, in non-production data. So how is that ideally, you know, scrambled, anonymized or whatever? Um, those are things that also need to be thought of. Just picking up on your point about compliance, what role do you see compliance programs playing in in the application security space and in the in the engineering side of things? The offshore piece is another is a whole other conversation when you think about the different laws in different countries. But I know you've had some experience in relation to things like ISO 27001. What, what's your opinion around compliance and engineering and, and you know where they meet? I think we're, again, it sort of goes back to organisational culture and um, it really goes down to how you kind of want to implement those those policies and also make sure that you're, you're protected. The old school way, the worst way I look at the old school ways is all through documentation and processes and those sorts of things, right? And so the verification side of actually making sure that these things are being followed is difficult. I think it, gets, it leads back again to, you know, I, I see a large part playing around like DevOps and DevSecOps for that sort of stuff. So yes, you need to document because parties need to be able to see these are the processes that, that are in place. But also think equally what you need to be able to do is to have automated systems in place which are like verifying and checking those things. So you've got tools which can potentially um, help you to generate your ISO documents and things like that. But also what you want to be doing is automating as much as possible. So rather than going, here is the step-by-step process of how we deploy something, it's this is our build pipeline, this is our release pipeline, it's all in the code. Equally with like role-based access control, rather than documenting, well, these people have got from a compliance standpoint where you're supposed to sort of document, you know, who's got access, you know, particularly privileged admin access to things. Well, it's all in the code, you know, like, and it's verifiable and it's executed every single time. So I think in terms of where I see the software engineering sort of side of things fall in place there, it's really around like, how do we automate all this sort of stuff so that it meets that compliance documentation in terms of actually also supplying it? Then also fundamentally, there is just general good software practices, I think, also just naturally fit into ISO. So making sure you've got things documented like, well, this is, you know, the the flow of something where it goes from an idea to how it gets into production. So good practices like doing code reviews, talking through, you know, like training expectations around like making sure people have got OWASP training or, you know, at a more org level, you know, phishing training and, and those sorts of things. I think also... The development environment is also an area where, you know, there's an impact there around it. So how do you have data practices around your production, non-production data? Also, how are, you know, your development environment set up? So, you know, we sort of mentioned briefly before offshore, you've got a whole lot of value IP, which is your code. So if you've got offshore developers, particularly if they're not through your company, but through a third party vendor, how do you make sure that or reduce the risk around, you know, losing IP? Do you set up environments up in the cloud? And, and that's the way you also potentially reduce the risk around IP and um, you know, data loss and, and those sorts of things. So I think there's a, there's a lot there in terms of how you comply with these sorts of things. And so then it's up to the org to go, well, what's the best way of, of, of moving forward? I want to finish up by asking you a bit about your transition from engineering to being a CIO, because it's not a normal 
well, not that it's not a normal path, but you don't see as many engineers become CIOs as you might see strategy and architecture leads or tech ops leads, you know, make that sort of step into the leadership role. So for you coming out of engineering and into that leadership position, are there particular things from a security perspective that surprised you? You know, what might other CIOs need to know or want to know about that transition from the engineering side through to that leadership where you go from one area of responsibility, I suppose, through to spinning many, many plates and then putting that security layer over the top? Yeah, I think the the spinning many, many plates, it's um, the first thing I would say to someone sort of looking to, to make that move is to keep it as simple as possible. Now, obviously, you've got to meet the needs of the, the organisation that you're working for, but you want to limit your attack surfaces. You want to make sure that not only you've got sufficient knowledge to um, you know, protect the, the resources that you put in place, but also your team, because you can only be spread so thin. So you may think, oh, I've got adequate knowledge in terms of how to prevent and, and manage at an implementation level things. The rest of your team may not. So some things would be like, um, generally speaking, I think cloud's a really good good place as well. Um, there's vendors like Microsoft on Azure or AWS or Google have invested a lot of time, money and energy to to try and um, make these platforms as, as secure as possible. Now, that doesn't mean that you can just go, okay, I'm on Azure or whatever, therefore all my security problems are going away, Microsoft managing it all for me. But if you look at things like using databases as a service or platform as a service, where you're not necessarily managing the virtual machines um, themselves, but you're your, your code is operating at a, at, a, at a higher level where these vendors are, do, are managing the patches for you. They are naturally constrained environments in terms of access to like the operating system or certain ports or whatever. You're also from a CRO perspective, you're also reducing your burden around from an operational standpoint around like having to manage and patch and all this sort of stuff. So it keeps things as simple as possible. To the above, where it makes commercial sense, um, you also want to probably reduce the number of vendors or minimize the number of vendors that you need to deal with. Again, it's less avenues, potential avenues of attack. It's less data privacy policies and things like that you need to be across and aware of because these people are managing and have access to your data. It just makes things as simple as possible. Automate where pragmatically possible. Um, for smaller businesses in particular, you obviously can't just build the Taj Mahal and automate everything. Um, so you're going to need to make sure that you've got a, a, a pragmatic blend, blend of things, but um, automation will definitely save you a lot of time and energy. I think single sign-on is, is also something which I found really useful. It's sort of something we drived and we picked vendors that we're working with based on how easy and effective it was to use single sign-on with them. The employees do leave businesses, so it's quite nice. Typically, with I'll leave on a Friday night, if you can just dis- disable their single sign-on and then worry about cleaning things up on a Monday, for instance, um, when you don't have automated um, deprovisioning of uh, access in place. The other thing I think, when, certainly when I moved into the CI role, is it's a little bit of a Captain Obvious sort of moment where you really need to take more of a holistic view of, of everything. I think um, when you're more potentially more of a CTO or you're a software engineer, you tend to just focus on the products that you're, if it's particularly if it's a digital product business that you're working on. Well, really you need to take, take a step back and you need to go, well, okay, now I need to look at like the entire organization from a information system standpoint, but also obviously from a security standpoint. So you know, how does data flow? How does identity flow in terms of source of truth? Who's got access to what? You know, uh, if I disable this identity or I make changes to these security groups, how does that impact? So you've got to take more of a, of a holistic view around things. Learnings from me, I, I guess I'd not had to deal a lot with like DNS security or email security around like DMARC, um, DKIM, SPF, and all these other sort of ways of protecting and, and making sure that you know, the emails that your organization is sending out is, you know, it's verified and it's, you know, it's trusted. So those sorts of things are things that you sort of definitely going to need to to wrap your head around. Um, the other sort of last couple of tidbits, I guess, is even if you don't have um, any customers or partners based in the EU, you really should get your head around GDPR. Even if you're not dealing with the EU, a lot of countries are building data privacy requirements that are very similar to GDPR and it's sort of, sort of the gold standard. So I think it's really important that you understand what a data processor is, what a data controller is, and what your obligations are really under GDPR if you were to to move into that space. I think that's really important in terms of setting up that baseline around how how you should consider the protection of personal data. And finally, you you probably do need to get a little bit familiar with reading legal documents, particularly privacy policies. Understanding how other parties are using, managing, and storing the data that you either control or are getting them to process. And do you feel like your technical background was a help or a hindrance in moving into a leadership role? And this could be a CIO or a CISO or, or any C-level position. 
there are many technical leaders who don't necessarily make that transition smoothly and are very detailed focused and love the the technical side of things. Do you think it worked well for you that you had that technical knowledge base or do you still feel kind of drawn back into the detail? I do think it definitely helped having a technical background, particularly for me working in, smaller business, in, a, in a smaller business. So lately I've been working mainly for startups. So it was definitely easier when talking to you know big you know shipping line multi billion dollar cybersecurity teams. Um, you know to have that deep level of detail on the phone calls and things like that, rather than being high level. I think for me the biggest sort of benefit in terms of being able to do that shift was more having a bit more of a consulting background. So um, again, it was more around the software and engineering space. But um, I was fortunate to work for a business where through their lifetime they went through a maturity of you know, having, you know, sort of an okay security sort of practices where they actually brought in people who came from a very security conscious background and actually seeing the evolution of, you know, how they took that business forward pragmatically. I think the other bit where the consulting piece really played out was essentially I got to see other people's mistakes and they were paying for those mistakes and I was sort of watching it. So um, (laughs) Never waste a crisis, right? (laughs) Exactly, exactly. So, you know, I got to see a lot of security penetration test reports. So when it was our turn to do penetration testing, I kind of already knew what the penetration testers were were looking for. And whilst you're not trying to, you know, secure the platform for the sake of just getting an A grade on on a penetration test, you know what the common sort of vulnerabilities are so you can already prepare the business for them. You know the sort of common sort of issues that other businesses face, right? So I, I think to me, the biggest um, for any, I would say any C-level sort of role, it's beneficial to spend at least some time in some sort of consulting capacity. So you get to see a, a, a wide range of different businesses rather than, you know, you've only worked for one or two businesses and you're sort of in that little bubble. I think it's really important and valuable to sort of go out and see all the different opportunities and, and problems out there. I think that's great advice. And, you know, being a consultant um, has it, <laughs> has its pros and cons, but it certainly gives you the other side of the coin. And, and you, I guess you get to give advice that it doesn't always get implemented, but you do get to see a variety of organisations and some of the challenges that they're faced with. So it doesn't surprise me that you were able to leverage that skill set as well as your your holistic background, I suppose, but your technical skills as well. And as a leader, you know, I guess you're you're drawing on those every day. Yeah, definitely. And I think also as a consultant, generally they only bring you in if there's a problem, right? So it's never dull, <laughs> right? So yeah. so you get to see you get to see them in air quotes at their worst all of the time, right? Like generally speaking, they don't tend to bring consultants when everything's like um unicorns, rainbows and, and sunshine, right? So um, <laughs> it's it's sort of one of those things where you sort of get a, get an eye opener in terms of all the different problems that, that organisations face. And I think that was certainly something for me, my six, seven years of experience across different roles in terms of consultant, where I, I think that was definitely um, something that was very valuable to me in terms of my transition. Stephen, thanks so much for your time today. I've, I've really enjoyed the chat and I think um, it's been a bit different to some of the other guests we've had on because we've really started to talk about some different areas of security leadership that um, that I hope will evolve even further. I really want to see the engineering space really open up more to security. And so thanks for your time and for bringing the software engineering community into the Security Collective today. No worries. Thanks very much, Claire. The Security Collective podcast is recorded and shared with you in partnership with LastPass, the leading password manager. LastPass enables companies of every size with the tools necessary to secure and centralise control of employee passwords and apps. You can learn more about LastPass at lastpass.com.